High Society in 20th Century Washington, D.C., 1908, Episode 5 A 19th Century Washington, D.C. Love Story Pearl and the Buffalo Soldier Prologue Coleman Family Tree Being a Negro in America is tough But we made it Chapter 1 I came here in a whisper I was born 1873 Chapter 2 The Perils of Growing Up Black in 19th Century America Chapter 3 Life in Washington DC 1909 Chapter 4 My Formative Years 1890-1910 Chapter 5 High Society in 20th Century Washington DC 1908 Chapter 6 Educating Washington DC Negroes 1912 Chapter 7 I was a flapper in Georgetown 1912 Chapter 8 The Buffalo Soldier 1917 Chapter 9-Top Coleman 1918 Book Information Pearl and the Buffalo Soldier John Coleman and Pearl Goodwin Coleman were my grandparents on my mother's family side. Her surname Goodwin was used prior to her marriage to my grandfather, John Coleman. She was born, B1897, by a midwife in Washington, D.C. and John was said to be born, B.1872, in Vienna, Dorchester County, Maryland. 1880 census Robert Coleman B.1855 John's father my great-grandfather was the son of Hooper B1820 and Mary B1830 Coleman my great great grandparents former slaves also from Vienna Dorchester County Maryland a brief history of African Americans in Washington, D.C. African Americans in Washington, D.C., 1800 to 1975. 1866. Congress votes black male emancipation except for those who served the Confederacy, paupers, and those convicted of an infamous crime or offense. 1867. Blacks vote for the first time in the district. The Evening Star writes that. The election put to flight the fears of those who apprehended serious disturbances on the occasion of the first exercise of the right of franchise by the colored people. John F. Cook, a black Washingtonian, is named chair of the Republican Party. Upper class black family, Washington DCC.1905 1868 Two blacks are elected to the Common Council. Sales J. Bowen, a radical Republican, is elected mayor. He advocates the integration of white and colored school system. 1871. Alexander Shepard and friends convince Congress to pass a territorial bill, merging all jurisdictions under a presidentially appointed governor and upper house, and a weak elected lower house. The new entity is called the District of Columbia. Among the members of the upper house was Frederick Douglass. The Georgetown Courier complains about Grant's appointments. Not one old resident, nor a Democrat, nor a Catholic, nor an Irishman, yet we have three darkies, Douglas, Gray, and Hall, a German, two natives of Maine and one of Massachusetts. This was the Reconstruction period, a short-lived moment of progress following the Civil War. This historical time has certain parallels, in both brevity and importance, with the short-lived period in more recent times known as the Civil Rights Movement. Black Society Washington's Black Society was as stratified as any in white America. Blacks in the city did not consider themselves a monolithic body, indeed, members of the black middle class known, with no insult intended, as strivers were more likely to socialize with whites than with black laborers. The social life of the city's black aristocrats revolved around voluntary organizations rather than places of employment. The city teamed with black social groups. The Knights of Pythias, Love and Charity, the sons and daughters of Moses all had large chapters in the district. At the turn of the century, Washington supported 11 black Masonic lodges and 24 black Odd Fellows Halls, 
with a combined membership of almost 4,000 members. The district also had a large number of black fraternities and sororities, nearly every black fraternity and sorority in America was founded in Washington. They acted as social service agencies, supporting, for instance, the Ionia Whipper, home for unwed mothers, founded and maintained on its strength in business and education, Washington's black aristocracy did not at any time wield or apparently seek political power. Yet even before the abolition of slavery, the city's black professionals did agitate for civil rights. The Black 400 of Washington consisted of fewer than a hundred families out of a black population of 75,000 in 1900. Centered around the family of Blanche K. Bruce, an ex-slave and former Mississippi senator who served in Congress from 1875 to 1881. Bruce was also the first black American to serve a full term in the U.S. Senate. Bruce's arrival in Washington aroused much comment, he was relatively young, cultured, and handsome. Even those who resented his presence in Congress could not find fault with his innate dignity, elegant manners, and shrewd political judgment. When he married Josephine Beale Wilson of Philadelphia in 1878, they set Washington society, both black and white, ablaze. Most noticeably because Josephine Bruce was very light-skinned, wealthy very highly educated and beautiful. During Bruce's residence in the district, he and Josephine entertained lavishly, taking a full part in official Washington society as possible. The Bruce's, along with other prominent black Washingtonians such as Hiram Rhodes Revels, PBS Pinchback, Josiah Settle, Robert Harlan, Norris Wright Cuny, etc., directly challenged notions about black Americans during that period. With the economic resources of physicians, public school teachers and administrators, attorneys, government employees, popular caterers and certain businessmen, there were Howard University faculty, and others within the colored aristocracy, many possessed wealth beyond comprehension. For the majority of black Americans at that time, according to an observer in 1895, the wealthiest blacks were John F. Cook, $200,000, Blanche K. Bruce, $150,000, W.A.A. Wormley, $115,000, and P.B.S. Pinchback, $90,000. A few not only owned comfortable residences in the city, but also country, places in Maryland and Virginia. Those who did not own such places escaped the summer heat by taking cottages either in the vicinity of Harpers Ferry, or at well-known resorts such as those at Cape May and Saratoga, which had sizable colored colonies. In the late 1880s, Charles Douglas, son of famed abolitionist Frederick Douglas, purchased a tract of land on Chesapeake, Bay about five miles from the Naval Academy at Arundel on the Bay. There he developed a vacation site for Washington's black elite, and christened the Place Highland Beach. Despite the hardening of racial practices and the erosion of civil rights for blacks in post-reconstruction America, the black elite held steadfast hope that blacks would achieve equality. However, this Black 400 was insulated against the hardships of Jim Crow, and many were accepted by white Washington society. Several black families were listed in the 1888 issue of Elite List, a forerunner of the social register. A few attended white churches, and even after certain public places closed their door to blacks, they sometimes made exceptions. In the case of refined and genteel, Negroes. Because of their successes, the notion that Washington was the colored man's paradise gained wide acceptance among blacks and whites anxious about the turning tide against integration and rehabilitation of the nation as Reconstruction began to die. Though the colored aristocracy was hampered with issues of color, refinement, and social status, they did nonetheless see 
themselves as a buffer between whites and lower class blacks. This was a buffer that would prove the equality and ability of black Americans in a post-Civil War society. Similarly the loss of local self-government that shortly followed during the post Reconstruction. The Jim Crow era was spurred by a combination of complaints of too much black power and not enough fiscal restraint. Again echoed much later in the time of Marion Berry Booker T. Washington, speaking to a gathering of the National Negro Business League in 1900, claimed that wherever he had seen a black man who was succeeding in business, who was a taxpayer, and who possessed intelligence and high character, that individual was treated with the highest respect by the members of the white race. Washington's statement betrays a strong and almost touching faith in the ability of business to better the lives of black Americans. In the District of Columbia such faith was not misplaced. It was economic success, more than anything else that earned the city's black aristocracy its power and respect from whites. At the time Booker Washington spoke, the district contained the largest black middle class in the country. Thousands of Monument and Freeborn Blacks had moved to the city decades before the Civil War, allowing a sizable black professional class to evolve well before emancipation. As early as 1827, black carpenters, plasterers, tanners, and pump makers had opened shops in the city. Surveys from the 1840s reveal a large number of free black tradesmen in the city, mostly barbers, blacksmiths, and shoemakers. The steadiest employer of black people in this period though, was the federal government, where blacks commonly worked as messengers and cooks. During and immediately after Reconstruction, the population of the city expanded dramatically. The many freed slaves who moved to Washington during these years more than 50,000 between 1870 and 1900 competed against the demobilized Union soldiers for federal employment. Perhaps inevitably, blacks began to be excluded from government jobs. As a result, black Washingtonians were forced, in the words of one historian, to work out schemes for solving their problems another way. That other way was independent business. Washington's black business boom began in the late 1880s. By the end of the decade, black Washingtonians owned two steamboat companies, a number of grocery stores, and several heating fuel businesses. The black-owned Adams Oil and Gas Development Company invested in Oklahoma's oil fields. Within 10 years the city contained a black-owned bank, capital savings, two black-owned insurance companies, Douglas Life and the National Benefit Company, and at least 11 black employment agencies. By 1892 the number of black businesses was large enough to support the Union League an association for colored mechanics, business and professional men and women. Their self-described aim was to better our moral and material status and make the conditions of success in the industrial and professional pursuits easier. As a pamphlet from the organization, aimed at the city's growing black middle class, promised, if you are employed in a store and aspire to be a clerk or salesman where you may learn the art of business from actual experience, we can help you. If you want to find such employment, we can help you. And help it did. Each year the Union League printed a directory of black-owned businesses for those looking for work or a place to shop to consult. There is no better index to the character and development of a people than the number and nature of organizations they sustain, declared the directory's editor. The booklet soon ran to more than 100 pages. Other leaders encouraged blacks to patronize black businesses. If the colored people are to have their quota in the skilled trades, in business, and in professions, editorialized one black newspaper in 1894. Many of these businesses were run by self-made entrepreneurs like Daniel Freeman, who had come to the city in 1881 from Virginia, penniless and looking for work. By 1901, at the age of 33, Freeman, 
a successful portrait artist, owned a bicycle shop, a framing business, and a photography studio on 14th Street downtown. He also was a Mason, president of the Social Temperance League, and, according to contemporary accounts, the ninth best rifle shot in the country. At the turn of the century and for decades after, Washington was home to hundreds, perhaps thousands, of Daniel Freemans. By 1894 more than 3,000 black families owned their own homes in the district. The total value of assets owned by black Washingtonians that year was estimated to be about $17 million. Some members of the city's black upper classes maintained country houses in Virginia, employed servants, and held debutante balls for their daughters. Others sent their children to predominantly white boarding schools and colleges in New England. According to a black journalist writing at the time, the district contained the most cultured, most advanced and intelligent, as well as the wealthiest members of the colored race. Many whites seemed to agree. At least six black families were included in Washington's first social register, published in 1888. Eleven years later, in 1899, students at Washington's one black high school scored higher than their white counterparts on citywide academic achievement tests. Just as affluent whites now flee to the suburbs in search of better schools for their children, many ambitious southern blacks came to the capital after the Civil War, drawn by the promise of a superior education. Good schools helped create a solid bourgeoisie, which in turn supported a thriving business community. And few schools in Washington black or white were better than Dunbar High School and Howard University. The expansion of black opportunity during Reconstruction dried up and by 1891 the many jobs for blacks in city government had disappeared and there were only 25 African Americans on the city payroll. Aside from those men involved in the butcher trade, the main business of the neighborhood, almost every black man was a common laborer, doing outdoor work that required no training. Every grown woman was in service or a laundress, picking up loads of wash and taking them home. By 1894 more than 3,000 black families owned their own homes in the district. The total value of assets owned by black Washingtonians that year was estimated to be about $17 million. Some members of the city's black upper classes maintained country houses in Virginia, employed servants, and held debutante balls for their daughters. Others sent their children to predominantly white boarding schools and colleges in New England. In 1899, students at Washington's one black high school scored higher than their white counterparts on citywide academic achievement tests episode 5 high society in 20th century washington dc 1908 upper class black women washington dc c 1903 thank you mr and mrs scribers i have much gratitude to mr and mrs scribers for letting me work for them as their bookkeeper and for teaching me the ways of washington dc high society a three-generation Negro family Washington DC C 1911 I was fortunate to be prepared for Washington DC high society I had my bookkeeping degree from Howard University the best Negro college in the country and one that was revered and idolized by Negroes near and far I was fortunate to attend the Dunbar high school for Negroes and I also attend the colonial school for girls a private pre-college and finishing school for Negro girls located on 18th Street NW. Mrs. Scribers said that the Colonial School for Girls would prepare me to move into and up in Washington, D.C. high society as it did for her. I am so grateful for this because this is where I began to meet the children of high society Negroes. I was eventually accepted as their friend, into their groups of friends. I was able to meet their parents who were the upper class elite in Washington DC Negro Society There was a saying around Washington DC that it was more important who you knew than what you knew to be successful in DC Negro High Society 
Every Negro woman and girl had an ultimate goal in life to meet a rich and important high society Negro man. If you weren't born into the DC upper class, then the next best thing was to marry someone who was already there. Howard University, Dunbar High School and the Colonial School for Negro Girls opened many doors for me into the elite Negro upper class society and from there, I was on my way. Mrs. Scriber said that by me going to the finishing school that sealed the deal. I was taught there to not only be smart, but also to look, talk and to act like someone who was from the high society elite. My other training came from being a Southern Maryland girl. All this training and experience ultimately led me to what I wanted to be. My experience was like that of a light-skinned Negro passing for a white person to get ahead. I found that if you were successful doing that, you wouldn't be treated badly as a low-class Negro by white folk or high-society Negroes. Many upper-class Negroes has the same ways as most white folk. Except if you were dark-skinned. They would treat you as just another low-class Negro. And most of the time, they wouldn't want to be bothered with you. Because they didn't trust you and felt that you were beneath them. If you were dark-skinned, they didn't want to be bothered with you either. Because they believed that you would bring them down. Negroes were something. They complained about how white folk treated them, but the ones passing for white or who were high class treated you the same way as some white folk. The idea was that white folk didn't want a Negro to go to school with their children, to live in the same neighborhood, to shop at the same stores, to go to the same church or and even to be buried in the same graveyard. This was passed on from generation to generation of light-skinned and upper-class Negroes. That really bothered me. A high society woman Washington DCC 1907. It wasn't anything that I could do to change their beliefs but I could always change me so I could be accepted, at least, into the upper class Negro society. Light-skinned, high society Negro. People were, in most instances, worse than white folk. They often worked harder at out, doing each other to be more white, looking and acting to ensure that they were accepted both in the white and the Negro upper class. If successful, they felt that this would ensure that they received a more favorable position in life than a lowly in country, as low class Washington DC Negro. There were only two routes that you could follow to take your place in Washington DC high society. For the low class Negro, you could attend Armstrong Technical High School, a vocational high school located in Northwest Washington, D.C., for low-class white folk, McKinley Technical High School in Northeast Washington, D.C. By attending these schools, you would be stamped as the other type of Negro and possibly be doomed to a lower-class existence for the rest of your life. High Society Businessman Washington, D.C. C. 1913 both schools were probably set up for lower class whites and Negroes, and although you got a good vocational education that would lead to a job, it could be a setback for moving up in Negro, or white, elite society. In most instances, you didn't get a good upper class job if you told people that you graduated from Armstrong Technical High School. Armstrong was a good school, and it prepared you to get a good job as a typist in the government, as a construction worker or for other low class jobs. My education and experience at Dunbar High School and Howard University with upper class Negroes prepared me for getting a good professional upper class job. It gave me the experience of going to school with upper class high society students prepared me for an upper class education and to look for and to find a future husband who was high society material. There isn't anything wrong with being a lower class Negro in Washington DC society, I had many friends that way, but that is not what I wanted. There were many low class 
Negroes who wanted the same thing. As I did, but they didn't or weren't. Able to do what I did. There were many low-class Negroes who wanted to climb Washington's society ladder, but they did not follow the route that I took because I felt in some way that I was special. You have to feel this way about yourself or you can end up being just another country ass Negro from the villages of Southeast Berry Farms or you could be from the mire and muck of the river town of Georgetown where lower class Negroes lived in squalor, crime and hard times I didn't want that for me, so I made my choice to work my way to the upper class Negro Washington DC society as a bookkeeper I could get a good job anywhere I didn't have to fight for a good government job white folk would offer me a job and they accepted my brains because of the way I would act and my light-skinned presence helped because they needed bookkeepers and because of my light skin they liked and trusted me colored folk did too but they often were much harder on trusting or accepting me because they felt that I should always act like a lower class Negro Many often said that I was acting like I was white Well, yes I was and that is what I wanted to do to get ahead in both Negro and white Washington DC society I ain't want to live like that To be plain, I do not want to be a low class Negro living the Negro Life in Washington, D.C. Doing this would be a move backwards for me. That society was full of ups and downs that I did not want to endure. Low-class Negroes were treated just like dirty and dumb field hands, even if you had a good government job. This was going back to the Southern Maryland situation that I left some five years ago. I lived that way before and I didn't want to repeat this or have my future children to live that way I know that I am someone special what it means to be a high society Negro woman as a high society Negro woman in Washington DC I felt that I had special rights upper class woman Washington DC C 1908 I knew that if I dressed talked and act like a high society lady people would treat me that way if they didn't they would often be afraid of who I knew among the Washington DC elite lawyers doctors and professional high society elite this was good for me and it kept the riff RAF away from me I kept myself around good quality hard-working and church-going people this was my weapon against ignorant and bad people I did what I had to do by continuing to work hard by studying my Bible and by going to church every Sunday by doing this God won't let these low-class evil people bother me I knew that my good and upstanding high society man was out there I decided to be patient and to wait on the Lord Negro men in Washington DC society there were two types of Negro men in Washington DC Buffalo Soldier C.1904 one type of Negro man was more interested in partying at bars every weekend getting high on liquor or Momo chasing and bedding down all the women they can there were some who were having lots of babies without being married, gambling, playing the big shot, getting locked up, cheating and bucking society. I did not want that kind of man. Then you had a better grade of Negro. Man who wanted something better for himself in life, who would get an education and a job. I wanted a man who would treat their women like ladies, who strive to make a better life for their wives and families and a man who work with and for white folk despite whatever hatred and distrust for white folk they may have experienced in the past I wanted a man who wanted to be more than just another Negro who hated whites the Civil War was over 50 years ago 
so we had to move forward. Hating and bucking white society won't help me or my people. I want a man who will fit in and who has confidence in himself to do good to and for others and to do what is right. This type of Negro man was hard to find in Washington DC except in the halls of Dunbar High School, Howard University and in my church. I still had to be careful of church going. Negro men, as many of them are in church for reasons other than to worship and to honor God. There are many wolves in sheep's clothing in church. Many want to know you if you show signs of being of genteel nature or open to believing their nonsense in the name of the Lord. A sweet and genteel southern negro woman had to be careful of these sinners, as they would swoop you up with sweet words, then drop their members in you and take off to leave you broken hearted and with child. I have seen so many of my girlfriends falling into that trap when they lowered their morals and decided to just find any negro man. There were numerous ways to end up living like a lowlife woman. Some were partying every weekend at juke joints, smoking cigarettes, drinking the spirits, dressing like a slut, and by giving your pleasures to any man who wants them. I didn't want to be that way, so I lived pretty much of a boring life. I kept to myself, I read and studied my Bible, I worked hard, and I attended church every Wednesday for prayer meeting and every Sunday for church services. I knew that one day, that man I was looking for would come along and be the right man for me. I just kept patient and trusted in the Lord until that day came. Next episode. Educating Washington DC Negroes, 1912, Episode 6. Just about everything that you need to know about the lives of African Americans in the 19th century. 19th Century African American Life History Series Online 19th Century African American History Series Living in Washington, D.C. Online 19th Century African American History Series Plantation Living Online 19th Century African American History Series The Great Migration North Online 19th Century African American History Series Jim Crow Loss Online 19th Century African American History Series Emancipation Proclamation Online 19th Century African American History Series Buffalo Soldiers Online 19th Century African American History Series Educating Black Children in the South A 19th Century Washington DC Love Story Pearl And the Buffalo Soldier Grandmother Jane An American Love Story in 19th Century Richmond, Virginia 1848-1938 Booker Tisms Educator, Orator, Ex-Slave, Republican, 1856-1915 Online 19th Century African American History Series Quotes by Booker T. Washington Since 2008 we have trained the staffs of Thousands of organizations nationwide. Author D. Harold Green is the owner of Workshops Go, our 18th year Faith Institute, headquartered in Jacksonville, North Carolina, is one of only two, two, African American owned, national and international education technology training companies in the United States. The goal of Skilled Force JOB National Community Trainer Academy is to develop a full-time national community-centric workforce readiness, entrepreneurship, and life preparation skills, soft skills, train the Trainer Academy program. Visit our website at https colon slash slash www.faithinstitute.org slash about hyphen us dot html. Our workshops can teach students how to work in a manufacturing plant or they can learn how to start their own manufacturing business d harold green ccmt more comments about our workshops we train trainers that's what we do a simplified online training infrastructure simplified certificate training easy access online workshops reduced training costs reduced days off for training we offer workshops go 
19th Century African American Life History Series. Reduce travel expenses for training access to over 200 online workshops Workforce readiness skills Start a business skills Life preparation skills Workshops Go 19th Century African American Life History Series No setup fees Start immediately Specify single workshops $4,799 100 plus attendees $5,949.150 plus attendees $7,969.200 200 plus attendees One year subscription plan We train trainers, that's what we do For more information contact D.Harold Green, CCMT Workshops Go A division of Faith Institute of Entrepreneurship Incorporated Jacksonville, North Carolina, 28540910-679-4319 Email trainers at faithinstitute.org